Funding for this program was provided by the Annenberg CPB Project. In a lawless age, people looked for immediate solutions to immediate problems. How to beat back the enemy. How to rebuild a working economy. How to stay alive. Until, out of anarchy, a new social order was put together that would restructure Europe. The Middle Ages, this time on the Western tradition. Now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. The Middle Ages were really invented by the Renaissance. By the 14th and 15th centuries, people felt that they were coming out of a long period of darkness into a world that could compare itself with the ancient world at best, or that could at least try. Since the dark, dirty centuries they left behind didn't deserve to be dignified with a special name, they just called them the age in between. Now we now realize that this dark and dirty age was also innovative and that in its thousand years or so after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Europe took on the shape and features that we know today. The Middle Ages began in the 4th and 5th centuries with the encounter of two peoples and two societies, Germans and Romans. By this time, when the Germans invaded the Roman Empire and overran Gaul, Spain, England, Italy, Rome was nothing but a shabby stage set and the two societies weren't all that different. Remember that since the 3rd and 4th centuries, a demographic and economic slump had been wearing down the network of roads and cities that the legions set up to protect the Pax Romana, diminishing both the comfort and the culture of the urban minority. And then, as the empire's urban civilization cracked, the pre-Roman, pre-colonial, rural substructure reappeared. Clans and gangs gathered around great landowners, around village leaders or tribal chiefs who provided the keystone of social relations. Local lords living in great villas on their rural estates became the real power in the countryside. And the countryside became as it had been before the Roman conquest, the real base of the economy. In due course, for several centuries, it became the entire economy. This change was radical for the towns, which we usually associate with civilization, but it was less noticeable in the countryside, which had always lived by its own rhythm, no matter who lived there. The barbarian tribes carried cultural baggage of their own, of course. They ate porridge and drank beer. They were more warlike, less disciplined, more inclined to individual freedom, and more abstract in their art forms than the people of the Western Empire. These people ate bread, drank wine, used cash, and built with stone. But that didn't stop the barbarian leaders from taking over some of their villas and some of their cities too, and from adopting the finery of a dying civilization. At the core 
the two societies of invading barbarians and of natives, the two societies were pretty similar. Both were rural, both owned slaves, both were dominated by strong aristocracies of almost equal brutality. And just as the aristocracy of Gaul had become Gallo-Roman after the Roman conquest in the first century BC, in the same way, a bit of Gallo-Roman civilization rubbed off on the German aristocracy in the fifth and sixth centuries, and a lot of Germanic barbarism rubbed off on the Gallo-Romans. So there was some integration between the two groups, especially at the top. But it was chiefly an integration downward towards the lowest common denominator. The economy was primitive, what you might call an agro-military economy. Production was at the subsistence level, and the only real source of profit was armed robbery and pillage. So the economic impetus provided by new inventions like the yoke, the heavy plow, and the crank resulted in better armed tribes, better able to build new states. The Saxons in England, Lombards in Italy, Franks in Gaul, and of these states, the most prestigious and the best known was the Carolingian Empire which Charlemagne brought to its apex. But what was the Carolingian Empire really? A clan or village chieftainship writ large with universal pretensions. This remarkable object is Charlemagne's sarcophagus. In fact, throughout the Middle Ages, talented and astute war leaders would increase their power by war, then they would die, leaving their whole house of cards to come crashing down because their heirs couldn't hold it up. Even Charlemagne's empire fell apart this way. Every spring throughout Europe, a king would call on his lords in their manners to follow him to war that is to join on plundering expeditions that went further and further afield. Most of the king's revenues didn't come from taxes, there were no tax collectors, instead they came from robbing the subjects of other kings or robbing lords outside his realm, and that's how the lord's revenues were raised too. The basic food and fuel of the kings and lords and everybody else on top, the knights, bishops, priests, came from the land, came from the peasants who worked the land. But that was just to live on. It didn't pay for weapons or luxuries or spices. Those had to be financed by the successful exercise of violence. This perfectly functional economy, especially if you liked hunting people and animals, turned on personal relations, on personal service, loyalty, obedience. It was all based on the exchange of gifts and services. I give you protection, you give me service. I give you service, you give me my keep. I give you land, you fight for me. It was a two-way movement up from the bottom, the weak sought the protection of someone powerful. Down from the top, the strong looked for men to work or fight for them. And it became increasingly obvious that of all the arrangements in which one man was subordinate to another, the highest, the most honorable, was to serve with a sword and a lance and a horse. Such a servant, bound to his master by all sorts of solemn oaths, was a vassal or liege. And this relationship was the basis of the feudal system which developed and reigned all over Europe throughout the Middle Ages, and which did not really disappear in many parts of Europe until the 19th century. In a period of chaos, 
Any man might be a fighter, but not every man could be one. For one thing, not everyone was cut out for it. For another, equipment was expensive. A helmet was as expensive as three oxen, and a horse was worth 18 to 20 cows. Then again, it took a long time to learn to handle a horse efficiently in combat and to fight in heavy armor. A Carolingian proverb says you can take a lad in his early teens and make a knight of him, but later, never. By this time, around the end of the 8th century, the heavy cavalrymen had come to be recognized as king of the battlefield. The stirrup enabled him to charge infantry and bowl them over, or to rise in the saddle and hack away with a sword. The heavy armor protected him from infantry weapons. The horse enabled him to wear the armor and fight in it without being excessively tired. And the horseshoe allowed the horse to cover a lot of ground with this heavy man on its back, even over rough terrain. It followed then that the cavalryman could swoop in suddenly, or he could get away swiftly, or he could hover around bodies of infantry that were too large to attack frontally and cut off their stragglers and ambush them when he chose to do so. All these advantages were realized by Charlemagne, who increased the proportion of cavalry in what had been a foot-slogging army. The value of cavalry would be emphasized further during the period of chaos, when the Carolingian Empire fell to pieces in the 9th century under the raids of new barbarians. More than ever, every man would be looking for a strong leader who could afford mounted men. Every leader would be looking for strong men who could fight on horseback. Only armed riders could beat back the Vikings, the Saracens, the Hungarians. But where were these expensive professionals to come from? Who was going to pay them? How were they going to be paid at a time when trade had decayed, currency was scarce or non-existent, and the supply of food itself was chancy? The answer was a set of relationships based on homage, one man belonging to another man, and lordship. And they were also going to provide a solution to the economic and logistical problems of primitive and disorderly societies in Europe. But it wasn't going to happen all at once. What we often call the feudal system, for simplicity's sake, is a generalization that covers a variety of arrangements and oaths and rituals and formalities over a long period of time beginning in the sixth or seventh centuries and culminating six or seven hundred years later. These can range from a household of retainers fed and clad and perhaps mounted by the boss, by the lord, the sort of thing that you can find even before Charlemagne, through groups of dependents, most visible in the 9th and 10th centuries, bound to the Lord by a fee or benefice, a gift of cash, a loan, a piece of land, the revenue from a piece of land. And it could range to the classic knight set up with a land grant which he holds at first precariously, that is, at the will of the Lord in return for his service and that of his retainers, or else for his lifetime, and which by the late 11th century becomes hereditary family property. Now, all of these different forms depend on what can be squeezed out of the producers, who are mostly peasants. And since they don't have much cash, we're talking of exactions in kind. Provender, labor, transport, different services. 
Now, by the 10th century, feudal protection rackets pretty much extinguished the remains of a free peasantry. The successful lord establishes his right to tax and tithe, his monopoly of hunting, his right over forest and commons. He forces the peasants to grind grain in his mill, to bake their bread in his oven, to get their fish for fast days from his pond, and above all, he imposes his justice, uh, the right to judge and fine and punish, which means not just power, but revenue. So what we call the feudal system is not just one system, but many systems. An organized disorder designed to subsidize professional fighters by exploiting the non-professionals. And when I describe it, please bear in mind that I'm talking about an ideal model that was approximated only rather late in the day. The vassal was quite simply another man's man, and the feudal relationship was that between the lord who had bestowed what we call a fee, and the man who had accepted it and who owes the lord his service in return. This fee could well be money, or the right to levy tolls on a certain bridge or ford or mill. But most of the time it was land, because land above all meant men who lived on it, and men meant power. In principle, the situation was quite simple. For instance, let's say you're the master of a great property. You can only defend it with men and arms. You may build a castle, you may build a keep, but even that has to be defended by specialists, by professional soldiers. You can only get these professionals by paying them. But how are you going to pay them? There's very little ready cash. Even the princes, the great barons, usually have to melt down the plate or hawk the family jewels when they really need some cash. And even if you offer the men coins, there would be no shops for them to spend them in. Nor can you afford to keep more than a limited number of men in your own castle, because there's just so much food in your stores. Carting things about is difficult. Even kings and counts have to migrate from manor to manor in order to eat up what's available in each and then move on. So, if you want to attach men to you, you have to give them land. Land with serfs on it, who work to provide the wherewithal for their new master's keep and for the equipment, and in return for the land, these men will fight for you. In other words, the land is a sort of wage and it's supposed to revert to you who gave it away when the wage earner has died or when he ceases to serve you. But in effect, you don't mind accepting the same services from a son or even from a son-in-law. And so over the generations, what had started as a purely personal fee becomes hereditary and the incumbents begin to treat the land as a right, even though it started as a kind of pay. Originally, a new vassal had to give his lord a present when he took over his fief, a sort of key money. This gift was called the relief, and it was important because it was going to modify the whole spirit of the system because over the generations, the Lord started to treat the fief he gave to his vassal less as a source of power than as a source of revenue. And the vassal came to look on the fief increasingly as his own property for which the relief had been something like a down payment. He felt that he could use the property pretty much as he pleased, not just leaving it to his heirs, but even selling it 
or giving it away, say, as part of a dowry or of some other deal. Eventually, everything became very complicated. In principle, you were supposed to be the man of one lord only. In practice, however, you might be the man of several different lords uh, because you may have accumulated bits of land through inheritance or dowries or exchanges to round out your holdings. And you would be in a quandary if your lords fought each other, which was not unusual. So in due course, around the 11th century, the old homage in which a man put his hands between those of the Lord and kissed him on the lips, this became increasingly symbolic. What really counted by the 12th century were money fees, which shows that cash was coming back into its own. And then, a hundred years later, we get contracts which spelled out the obligations of the contracting parties. And this was the beginning of the end. Remember that the feudal system had been elaborated to cope with the problems of an economy where money was scarce and broader social structures were fragile or non-existent. It had answered the problem by emphasizing personal relations from man to man and payment in kind by an exchange of services. But as the money economy gradually reestablished itself, as social order reappeared, the feudal arrangements of a chaotic age gradually gave way despite attempts to adapt to new conditions, they became increasingly anachronistic. Something did remain of the feudal relationship, however, and that was the importance of personal relations and personal affections. And this intimate bond was so powerful that when the poets of southern France invented the idea of courtly love, in the 12th century. They conceived the faith of the perfect lover on the model of the devotion of a liege to his lord. The perfect lover was the perfect vassal. He swore allegiance to his lady on bended knee, and the same gesture with the hands joined together, which was the gesture of homage, became the gesture of prayer, which it had not been before. In other words, you paid homage to God, the Lord above. Also living in the feudal system and writing all this down were the clerks and monks who were part of the system's power structure and crucial to its culture. They interpreted what was going on. They recorded events according to that interpretation and they told the ruler what it was he was really doing as well as what he should be doing. This clerical enterprise had its roots in the Jewish Old Testament, and this, for example, is the coronation of David, and it had its roots in the Roman classics. It stressed that the ruler was appointed by God to carry out God's will on earth. And God's will was the public good. In this case, the practice of Christian virtues as determined by the church and the application of Roman law. The king's task then was to lead the people to Christian salvation and like the emperor Augustus, to bring peace to the land, maintain order and protect the weak and the poor. But this model invented by the clerics went against the reality of royal power. If you turn the king into a prince of peace, you diminished his own revenues and you weakened his hold on the lords whose chief interest was war and loot. If you made the king protect the weak and the poor, you offered him allies who could give no support and you put him on the opposite side from the nobles whose revenues came from exploiting the weak and the poor. 
The true masters in the Middle Ages were not the men of peace after all, but the men who knew how to fight and who had the weapons and the horses to do it. They built their keeps, or better still, their castles for local defense, and this means their own defense. It has been said that peasants could take refuge in their lord's keep. But in the typical keep, there wasn't room for refugees, for their cattle, for their wagons, and so on. The peasants did indeed live in terror of raids and pillage from outside. But when they had to look for refuge, they looked for it in the hills, in the woods. The lords furnished no refuge. They were simply in the protection racket. If a neighbor beat up their peasants or robbed them, they beat up his peasants and robbed them. And it was this role as protector that permitted the lords to appropriate an ever-growing portion of the peasants' crops. So here we have three classes taking shape each with different interests and with different pressures. The lords and their violent retainers, the peasants and the clergy. We shall see how they work together and how they struggled against each other next time. <laughs>